Hello and welcome to AGI's Geo Webinar Series. My name is Leela Gonzalez and I'll be moderating today's GeoConnection webinar, Engaging Geoscience Alumni as Career Resources. Now in today's webinar, we're going to be hearing from faculty and alumni from the Geoscience Departments at St. Lawrence University and Georgia Southern University and listen to them discuss strategies for reaching out and engaging Geoscience Department alumni as career resources. We'll be starting off with Dallas D. Rhodes, who is an Emeritus Professor at the Department of Geology and Geography at Georgia Southern University, and Susan Taylor, who's an alumna there. And then with that talk, will be followed by a talk by J. Mark Erickson, who's the Chapin Professor of Geology at St. Lawrence University, and Sarah B. Z. McElfresh, who's an alumna at the uh, St. Lawrence University. They'll be talking about uh, the case study from their university. And then we'll follow up with about a 10 minutes for a panel discussion and questions and answers at the end. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and turn our presentation over to Dallas and Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dallas Rhodes. Uh, I am the former chair of the Department of Geology and Geography at Georgia Southern University, uh, where I served for 12 years in that capacity. We left last summer. and. Uh, my uh, cohort today is uh, Susan Taylor, who used to be Susan Howell, who was a student of ours. Uh, Susan earned both un undergraduate degrees in both geology and geography at Georgia Southern, as well as a minor in GIS, and then went on to graduate school at uh, Vanderbilt University. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, I've just completed my graduate studies and I am currently working at Dewberry in Fairfax, Virginia as a consultant. Um, my field is in coastal engineering and so I'm specialized in looking at climate change and coastal engineering. We're going to start today by talking about some of the potential roles for alumni within departments of geoscience. And um, I want to emphasize that those roles are varied, and then in fact they have changed over time. I think most everyone recognizes that uh, alumni have always been a source of, uh, or at least hope to be a source of funds to support the department and also friends to support the department. But uh, that has been, and that has manifested itself through department newsletters and social activities of various kinds that. Um, various professional meetings, GSA, AGU, et cetera, uh, some kinds of activities hosted by the department. Um, recently, uh, however, alumni have also been called upon as an important source of information for a range of program assessment ideas. Mentoring of students has also been an important part of that program. Uh, and. Uh, that's led to things such as internship programs, support for scholarships, and sometimes even the possibility that alumni will help provide employment opportunity for students. As Susan and I have thought about this, we've tried to break it down into, take those number of categories and break them down into some very, very important ideas. First of all, under social activities and department newsletters, what we're essentially talking about is keeping alumni connected with the department. If you are from a department that has always done a good job of keeping your alumni connected, um, this isn't an issue. I, uh, I was very impressed this last summer. I spent a little bit of time at the University of Wisconsin and wandered around their department where they have uh, pictures of their groups of students and faculty for years dating back into the 1920s. And I was able to recognize a number of friends and colleagues in those pictures. Those pictures have always, I'm sure, draw the alumni every time they return to campus. Other departments, particularly relatively new ones, don't have much of an alumni base. And so they're basically starting from scratch. And keeping alumni connected has its difficulties. Uh, department newsletters have been a traditional way of doing this. More recently, there are social media that also fulfill this role. Clearly, one of the reasons that departments have tried to keep their alumni involved is for fundraising, to support the department through direct contributions, but also by being friends for the department when, uh, when the need arose. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, 
program assessment has become very important for most departments. Uh, the need to be able to document that the program is actually accomplishing the goals that it set for itself and that the alumni have been able to be successful once they've left the department has become ever more important for department administration and for the faculty as well. Susan? Uh, yes, a key role that uh, alumni can play with the current students is um, by encouraging professionalism. Um, and this can happen in, in uh, several manners. And one is mentoring. Um, they can do this by advising on career opportunities. Um, and uh, being a resource outside of the academic advisor, uh, being called upon to just advise them on different opportunities that exist or paths that they, they should uh, potentially look into or just any lessons learned um, from coming from the same university. Um, and then also uh, alumni can provide uh, internship programs. Um, and this can stem from even, uh, from my experience, various uh, projects uh, for, for a class and how doing a, a class project for, for an alumni company can lead into internship uh, opportunities. So it's, it's important for a department to make sure they keep in touch with their alumni and to keep uh, current positions and internship opportunities available to students. Uh, and then alumni can also assist directly by um, contributing to scholarships. Uh, and this is just a chance to get back directly to the department. If, if uh, scholarship programs have been um, been a while for, uh, been around for some time, then uh, alumni might be able to to recall how this funding helped them while they were a student. Uh, and then employment opportunities is also uh, a huge factor for alumni. It's a it's a direct way to help your students find uh, jobs quick after graduating. So to summarize, there are a variety of reasons to keep your alumni engaged. Gathering financial support, showcasing accomplishments are pretty traditional ones that I think everyone recognizes. But right now, with many departments under some duress because of funding cutbacks, particularly a public institution, the need to strengthen relationships with the administration is ever so important. If you happen to be somebody really lucky, like the University of Texas or Oklahoma State, and have, a depart have an alumnus who happens to have a few hundred million dollars they can part with, I think your administration will look favorably upon your department for a long time to come. But even if they don't have those sorts of resources, it's remarkable what a solid word from an alumnus at the right moment, uh, what a difference it can make. If the president continues to hear consistently uh, when he meets with alumni that they are happy with the program, that they, where they earned their degree, that it prepared them well for the future, that it's made a difference in their lives, those sorts of messages stick and make a real difference. Um. And to elaborate why it's so important to engage alumni, um, uh, is that they can encourage professional attitudes among students. Oftentimes, uh, when alumni come back to the department, this is the first step or first attempt for students to work on networking and, and begin to consider professional opportunities. Um, it's often insightful to hear uh, and see how someone with a similar training makes use of their degree, um, and they have the ability to, uh, to discuss career avenues. Uh, and it's important to begin those when you're a student, uh, not after you graduate. Um, also, alumni provide a resource uh, for research collaboration and resource sharing with the faculty members. And this applies to alumni continuing to grad school and to those also entering the industry. Uh, and this goes beyond publishing your, your undergraduate thesis. Um, from my experience and, and my classmates, this includes uh, typically just using faculty as a resource for any sort of intellectual question and, and vice versa. Faculty can reach out to, to their previous students. Um, providing facilities or equipment to, to, the, to the department. Um, Dallas, I know, came to give a seminar at Vanderbilt when I was a graduate student and made use of some of our grain size analyzer uh, equipment. So staying engaged with alumni increases the department's resources both intellectually and physically. Um, and, and also, it's important to recognize that your alumni also become your colleagues. Uh, and then lastly, providing internships and employment for students. Um, it's important to stay in touch 
uh, with alumni in their current positions as they, as they change and, and grow in their careers. Um, departments should request the, the available internships and distribute to students. And in the industry, um, it's, it's typically uh, inside incentives are offered, monetary incentives are offered to employees to bring in good students. So, so alumni are willing to do so. Um, and also inviting alumni to career fairs. Oops. Sorry. Um, we also want to talk about a broader picture outside of the department and uh, the impact of uh, alumni on workforce issues. This fairly busy slide is one that I drew a few years ago for uh, an article I published in GSA Today. But what it shows is the relationship, the, the well-known relationship for those of us who've been around for a while, between boom and bust cycles in the petroleum industry and um, the wealth and health of uh, geology departments. Um, the black line that's here shows the nominal price, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, in, uh, inflation adjusted price of petroleum for the period from 1945 up until 1909, uh, 2009. Right? And we can see there's a very clear relationship between the incredible growth in the price of petroleum in the 1970s and a growth in the number of people earning undergraduate degrees in the geosciences. That, for those of us who were around back then, it stressed the departments enormously to try to handle uh, the number of majors as they increased upwards in over 7,000 students. But when the bust came, the drop-off in the number of students in the uh, programs was even more rapid than the drop in the price of petroleum. From a high of more than 7,000 students in 1982 to a low of uh, well under 2,000 students in the early 90s, um, the drop was catastrophic. If, if this was any sort of vital sign, this would be a near-death experience. I mean, uh, departments had to adjust uh, in ways that they never envisioned. And uh, the chaos that it caused among geoscience departments and the alumni was pretty dramatic. Since that devastating experience, uh, growth in the geoscience programs has uh, is hinged largely upon the diversification of opportunities. And uh, people at AGI and, uh, have made the case that uh, perhaps at long last, uh, geoscience have almost have come unhinged from uh, the changes in the petroleum industry, that they're not going to rise and fall together. And certainly, this last change in petroleum prices had basically no effect whatsoever on the number of people earning undergraduate degrees in the ge geosciences. The other major trend that has taken place over the last few years is the growth in the number of women earning degrees in geosciences. And Susan's going to say a few words about that. Yeah. When, when Dallas and I were discussing this presentation, um, I commented how it, in my undergraduate studies, I was one of probably two or three females in the department. And I was so amazed when I moved to another school, it was predominantly female. But it, uh, Dallas said that this seems to be the transition from, uh, from few to many females within departments. Um, work is still needed, I think, on the representation of female ge uh, geoscience faculty members. Um, uh, opportunities, I think, should be discussed and, and encouraged with uh, female students. But I think we should look at this graph and can consider what it means in terms of female alumni. Certainly, many have reached the point in their career where they can provide mentoring. Um, and tying this back to the few female professors, the uh, female alumni can be a huge resource to female geoscience uh, degree seekers. Currently, there's a web resource for students and young professionals called um, mentornet.com. And it's pushing for a need for both earth science mentors and especially females, because it just doesn't exist right now. This change has had a dramatic effect on the workforce, and we're going to look at just, uh, some data from AGI on just one aspect of the workforce for a moment. This is uh, employment in the petroleum industry, and this is uh, showing you the age distribution of people working in the oil and gas industries in 2008. And you can see very clearly that there's a huge hump here of people in their late 40s and in their early 50s, then this dramatic decline which corresponds to the decrease in the number of uh, opportunities in the petroleum industry, and then we've seen a little bit of resurgence in the last few years that's come back. The important thing to realize is that these people 
in this big hump are moving toward retirement, although perhaps not as rapidly as they thought they were a couple of years ago. But within the next 15 years, many of those people are going to reach retirement age, and there simply aren't people behind them to fill those positions uh, in the future. And it goes beyond just the petroleum industry. This is uh, some work that I've done with membership data for the Geological Society of America. And what we've got here is a classic demographic pyramid with um, males plotted on the left, females plotted on the right. These are five-year birth cohorts. And e the length of each bar shows the percentage of the total membership of the Geological Society of America in January of this year uh, in each one of those birth cohorts. And we can see that this is anything but a smooth pyramid. Here is the, the baby boom generation. Uh, this big, and although this corresponds to the baby boom generation, it appears that it isn't necessarily just the baby boom that made a difference here. This is largely a result of post World War II scientific expansion in programs such as NASA and NSF and, and for NDEA. Uh, many people of my generation's generation went to college with national defense education grants and scholarships, and those people are still in the workforce, although they are moving out of the workforce fairly quickly now. Within the next five years, I'm not sorry, the next 15 years, uh, more than half of the current membership of uh, GSA is going to be 50 years and older. Right? We also see in this, this dramatic decline, this waste right here, and this corresponds to the bust in the petroleum industry. The people who were 20 years old in 19, 85 were caught right in the middle of the decline in petroleum prices, and those people stopped majoring in the geosciences. Over the last few years, membership of GSA has grown back. Right? And uh, in fact, one of the major changes we're also seeing again is this near equality in the number of men and women in the field is, uh, is particularly true in the most recent cohorts. Uh, in the distant past, obviously, that was not the case at all. Remarkable difference there. Um, this has profound implications for the future of the workforce. Uh, this is more data from AGI. Um, the black line in this graph, the data current as of 2008, the black line in this graph shows the current workforce declining over time as people move into retirement and die. The blue line shows the current workforce with uh, new entries, that is people entering into the field from the United States population. The dotted yellow or orange line shows the workforce plus, the current workforce plus additions from the United States plus additions from outside the United States. So this would be the expected total workforce, while these lines in green show what the expected uh, demand is going to be. Uh, um, the solid line representing a high demand, the middle line sort of a mid-level demand, and the dotted line a low increase in demand. Nevertheless, the disparity increases over time so that we have a substantially greater demand for people in the geosciences than we are being able to produce and being able to support. And as of the moment, it's not clear how that demand is going to be met. In terms of uh, demand outside of oil and gas, uh, just just coming off of a recent uh, job search, the demand is there for uh, uh, academia. Uh, several years ago, it wasn't it wasn't as high, but it certainly exists right now. And then also with uh, just, uh, experience in looking for positions in the consulting um, consulting field, uh, there are quite a few positions, both uh, for science based and technical, as well as project management. Um, most uh, most companies or private firms uh, are continuing to hire, and most are continuing to look for into interdisciplinary approaches and, and climate change and contracted to the government. This highly conceptual figure is something that I've produced as part of uh, some work I've been doing with uh, CERC for the traveling workshops for uh, uh, departments. And what I'm trying to show here is something relating to the, the scope of influence of different kinds of activities that are beyond the curriculum and how long it takes for those activities to produce some kind of desired result. For example, something like an increase in the quality of advising affects only a relatively small range of people, the students, 
but you get an almost immediate impact for it. Um, something like the website, on the other hand, affects everyone from potential and current students through faculty, alumni, uh, the, your college colleagues, university administration, the profession as a whole, and even the community may consult the, the website. So its reach is very broad, and designing and putting together a new website, although certainly not instantaneous, is something that happens in fairly short order. Right? On the other hand, and activities like trying to build endowed scholarships while they may affect a relatively narrow part of the spectrum of participants in the department, may take years or literally decades of effort before those activities actually produce the desired result. And of all of the kinds of activities that the department can engage in, alumni relations may be the absolutely most diffuse. You know, it covers a big area, which makes it look very important. But what it really shows you is it takes a lot of time with a lot of people produce good results. And it's important to realize that building good alumni relationships starts with building good student relationships. This figure shows some of what happened to Georgia Southern uh, during the years after I began my career as department chair there. When I started in fall of 1998, we had 23 students in the department. And I was under a strict orders from the uh, senior administration to grow the size of the department as quickly as possible. And the first things we started doing uh, and the faculty very clear that we needed to build the, uh, the quality of the event for our students. So we did things like restarting the uh, seminar series, which had become um, inactive. We restarted the department's newsletter in the very first year. We started hosting gatherings for our alumni at uh, homecoming events. Uh, we began participating in the community uh, in every way we could think of, community open houses. And very importantly, we started hosting an annual get-together for the students, which was a dinner and an awards banquet, where some of the serious awards were presented and some not-so-serious awards were presented, both by students and the faculty. And it's interesting that Susan joined us right in here in the fall of 2000, just as this curve began to sweep upward toward uh, the goal of reaching 100 majors, which we finally attained in the fall of 2004. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, something I noticed, this is being a student, is that the recruitment of new majors really started with uh, talks and intro level classes, and also with the department growing and, and being able to offer uh, field trips uh, to Ecuador and out west. Um, and then also the hosting of the Savannah uh, uh, Geological Society of America. I, I had graduated at the time, but it, it encouraged me to come and come and present. And it was a huge mark for for what was a small uh, small department. And uh, the alumni meeting there was more of a celebration and a, a prideful event. One of the things we really want to focus on as well is making sure that we keep track of who our audience is and any kinds of these activities we undertake. If we're trying to impress our alumni, we may take one tack. If we're trying to t impress the administration, the approach may be somewhat different. Um, this is a figure that I pulled off the web some time ago showing what kinds of things that every single university website has on its front page. And this figure shows what kinds of things people typically go to the front page looking for. Right. In addition to what's in this graph, uh, pictures are, are a main thing that students look for, and also faculty research and what, what have previous students done, and uh, job opportunities. Facebook, although some might resist it, it, it continues to be uh, just a, a media where so much uh, of the population is on it, and it's a great way to keep everyone uh, together. Um, we want to emphasize as well that the website is terribly important. Website quality varies enormously. Here's an example. I'm not picking on Towson. Actually, this was a, a website form that was imposed upon them, but clearly is not very interesting, particularly if you compare it to something like this one from Indiana, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Clearly, the focus here is on students. The pictures all have people in them. The links are clear. When students come to this website, they're going to be able to use it very quickly. Um, We've mentioned some of these activities, so I'll, I'll skip through them very quickly. So to point out, there's Susan right there, for those of you who don't know her. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, you know, again, the experience that, that the students have is the most important thing of all. One last thing we wanted to show you, to emphasize, is how the change in focus can manifest itself very clearly. 
This was the first department newsletter we produced in the fall of 1998. This was the department newsletter we produced 10 years later. Not only has it become far more professional, but the most important thing is the focus is on the students. If you want to have you want to have good active alumni, you've got to start when those people are still your students and do everything you can to tie them to the department as much as possible. Susan? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the key for, for alumni's perspective is just building relationships uh, while, while the students are there. If you want good, good alumni, it definitely starts with the students. And the, the website and the newsletters being the, the largest portal to keep your uh, alumni uh, aware of what's going on, uh, any developments in the department, um, because they will certainly, certainly look at what the, how the department continues to grow. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dallas and Susan. That was great to find out what Georgia Southern is doing. Um, some very interesting activities. So thank you for presenting today. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to Mark Erickson and Sarah McElfresh from St. Lawrence University. And Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and change the presenters over to you. So when you are ready. I'm Mark Erickson. I'm a paleontologist at St. Lawrence University. St. Lawrence is a small liberal arts college of about 2,000 students in upstate New York. It's a private college. Uh, the department has roughly uh, 30 junior, senior member, uh, majors and roughly the same amount of freshmen and sophomores who are interested in the major. Our major begins at the end of the sophomore year. Consequently, we can't count all 60 of them, but, but there are about 60 active majors in the department at any one time. Presently, uh, we're divided about 50-50 between men and women in the major. Uh, I've been at the university for about 40 years. I'm, I have served as department chair a number of times. And I'll offer the faculty student perspective on uh, engaging alumni in career resources. Uh, Sarah? Hi, my name is Sarah McElfresh. I graduated from St. Lawrence in 1998, and from there I went on to the University of Pittsburgh for a degree in planetary, uh, in planetary geology. And I'm going, I'm a member of the Alumni Council for, the, for St. Lawrence, and many of the activities of which we're going to talk about today, I am one of the, the coordinators. This is obvious, and I think you've probably heard it before, but all alumni begin as your students. And I think that the focus of one's attention needs to be on that point uh, throughout the career of the student at your school. There are practices that can make a positive career outcome from the faculty student alumnus relationship and we would like to discuss several of those today. Professionalism is one of the main foci for that uh, development. There's an important influence of professionalism on students uh, interest and success in the department and the major and in their career. Learned societies do a major service by offering student memberships and by encouraging student participation in national meetings. The initial contact between students and alumni in our program is often made during alumni receptions at such national meetings where students have come to perhaps present their research or to see what the profession is all about. Sarah? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just run through some of the, the things that we do. Mark mentioned the um, alumni gatherings at conferences. We also have a newsletter that has been going on since the 1940s. We run an alumni conference, which will be the bulk of our presentation. Uh, we also have an alumni website that is separate from the department website. Now, the alumni website is run by the alumni, where the department has um, at the university. We've also entered the foray into social media that Dallas had mentioned using Facebook and LinkedIn. And the department, faculty, and alumni and students use these 
together and um, to be beneficial for each other. Mark? Our most useful and consistent connection to alumni is through the department newsletter, as you no doubt heard before. The newsletter was begun in the 1940s. Uh, we don't know the exact date. We've lost the, the early ones. But this issue in 1959 includes the two things that I note here as uh, the most uh, normal uh, information that alumni are interested in. Uh, departmental information, what's happening in the department and who's doing it, and information about classmates. What are the alumni doing, and especially what are your immediate classmates doing? Sarah? As, as uh, Dallas mentioned with their newsletter, ours has evolved quite a bit as well. Seen here is the first page of our most recent uh, newsletter, which talks a lot about our alumni conference that happened in the fall. Our newsletter is mailed out to the alumni twice a year, and it contains news about current students, the kind of research they're doing, any awards that are won, um, alumni events. Each of the faculty members writes a little news, writes a letter to the alumni saying what they've been doing and their students. Alumni submit news uh, ranging from birth of children and marriages to the research they're doing uh, and, and whatnot. And this, as I said, is mailed to the alumni, which helps keep track of the alumni base because if an alum has moved, you get that um, you know, return from sender um, and you, have, you know you need to track them down. Uh, we also have our newsletter available online. And, and many people, when they move, they go to the website. To, they, they realize they didn't get their newsletter. They go to the website, see that it was mailed out, and then discover that they're a missing alum, and they need to let the university and the department know where they are. And um, other communication between alumni and the department and alumni and alumni happens right after the newsletters are received. Um, it, it, there's just that spike in communication and wanting to share information. Um, as I said, that goes on to the alumni website. And our alumni website started very basically back in 1996. It was just a list of email addresses by class year to help facilitate communication between alumni and students. Uh, since then, it has evolved uh, a great deal. And as I said, this is run by the alumni. So it has information that the alumni deem necessary and important and what they wish to learn from each other. And that includes um, notification of awards and news stories, much like the newsletter, but more in, in real time. Uh, a great deal of the news of the website is devoted to our alumni conference and our alumni medal that we give out for service. It also talks about our, our funds. We just started a fellowship, actually in honor of Mark Erickson, um, that we're hoping to get endowed, as well as other fellowships for summer research and other funds that were started by alumni over the years to help benefit the students. And we, on our website, alumni can find out about progress, how to make donations, um, and so forth. And so again, newsletter is all, the newsletter is on there, as well as um, information on alumni gatherings at different uh, conferences. Um, Facebook is used in much the same way as the website, but it's also useful for more immediate connections. We have many alumni who are seen on CNN and Countdown with Keith Olbermann and other uh, outlets like that, and we're able to announce that on our Facebook group. Uh, that people can see right away to know to tune in uh, to catch them. Uh, we also link to news stories that mention alumni that may or may not, um, depending on time, make it to our website right when it happens. And it's another method of communication with alumni. There are some alums that are members of our Facebook group that we don't necessarily have another way of communicating with. Um, but we can send them a message through Facebook. and. and try to get their address and their email and, and whatnot. Our Facebook group is also used by alumni seeking other alumni or students who are working in the same um, field area or are looking for uh, someone as an environmental consultant for their company. And so it's used uh, in that regard as well. Um, as also LinkedIn, we have just started, again, for alumni and faculty and students where we use to announce job and internship openings. And another method of communication 
uh, to be used as an email base or as um, people seeking help in, in certain areas, um, as well as looking to be introduced to other alumni. You can see who's, who's a member of LinkedIn and find out who you know and see who can connect you to those people. And that has been very fruitful for several of our um, alumni in the last couple of months. Uh, Mark? Like most departments, we maintain a web page that conforms to the campus net image. It's useful for prospective students, but it lacks creativity and opportunity to demonstrate our productivity and our diverse abilities and interests. It is not career-oriented, nor should it be, probably. Next. Our most informative alumni student contact is the Triennial St. Lawrence University Geology Alumni Conference, affectionately known as SLUGAC. It involves talks by alumni, panels on career pathways, panels on graduate student and graduate school opportunities. Uh, it has many, many opportunities for networking and for informal visiting among alumni and students. Our students present uh, to the alumni their research, and they show their professionalism. Much networking goes on in all directions. Next. What is LUGAC anyway? For students, it's an opportunity to show their stuff to the people who care enough about St. Lawrence geology to come to Canton at their own expense to share with you their work and experiences, to answer your questions, to suggest a vision of the future, to inform you of their discoveries. This is what I tell students as we are beginning to introduce the idea of SLUGAC to them. Uh, usually at the beginning of the fall semester of the year that it occurs. From the faculty point of view, I point out to our students that altruism of the, fac of the alumni who are participating at their own expense is a driving factor uh, in, the, in making this happen. Alumni travel far, Alaska, Louisiana, Kansas, Alberta, Texas are some of the states that were represented at our most recent uh, SLUGAC conference last fall. Sarah? Um, and so why, why do we do SLUGAC? Why did the alumni choose to come back? Um, for many from my generation of alumni, we had the benefit of experiencing a SLUGAC as a student and interacting with alumni. Um, my first one was our second that happened in 1995, and some of the alumni that I connected with at that meeting I consider some of my closest friends um, today, um, back to sitting in, in, in the Department of Geology, just sitting listening to people talk. Um, but why do we come back? We come back to share our, our life experience with the students, to let them know what, what they can do with this degree, um, to introduce the students to what it means to be a geologist and, and what does it mean to be a geologist if you're in the petroleum industry or if you're an environmental consultant or if you're a, a teacher. You know, it can mean many, many different things and the students are able to, to find out what it means to two different people who are environmental consultants, who are presidents of their own environmental consulting firm. Two people who did very similar things yet the paths they took to get there were very different. Um, and so to share with students how we got where we got um, and to also share the science that we do with current students and fellow alumni and the faculty. Um, we come back to network with each other. Um, many alums who graduated in the 70s and are looking for um, people to, to come into their companies um, and they want not only the students but they're also looking for, for other fellow alumni who may be a little younger than they are. Um, we also come back to let students know that there are many things you can do with a degree in geology. We aren't all practicing geologists, and that's important for St. Lawrence because we are a liberal arts university, um, and so that 
ties into um, the, the nature of a liberal arts degree that you can do different things. And we also come back to just reunite with old friends and faculty and, and make new friends that have uh, common interests um, and just to see what all we do. Um, this got started in kind of a unique way. There were three alums who were on a, a hiking trip, and they were gabbing around the campfire and said, wouldn't it be great if someone had told us what, had ha what life would be like after we graduated? And they talked it over some more, and one thing led to another. And in 1992, the very first Luke Act was held. And afterwards, they decided they had such a good time, and it was a success, and they enjoyed interacting with students that they thought it should, hap it should happen again. And that was when um, it was decided that it would be every three years. Mark, I'll let you take over. Yeah, so the reasoning behind this as a triennial event is uh, the hope that all students will be able at one time or another, all majors at one time or another, will be able to attend at least one of the geology alumni conferences. Uh, if they're freshmen at the time, uh, they might be so fortunate as to attend two, one in their freshman year and one again in their senior year. Uh, but at least they'll have the opportunity to uh, be involved in one alumni conference. So it's a triennial event uh, that's very difficult for the university administration to factor in. Uh, three years is beyond the, the administrative memory of most uh, most administrators, and it certainly makes the budgeting a bit difficult because uh, they always try to wipe out whatever funding we have. And so I'll warn you, uh, watch out for the way these things are budgeted because you'll lose your, <laughs> your funding in the uh, two years intervening. Uh, the uh, event includes a featured lecture, the Bloomer Lecture, which is supported by alumni donations. Uh, generally, the lecturer is a, an alumnus of some renowned himself or herself, and that lecture is open to the public, so we try to make a, a public event out of this uh, as well. Uh, most recently, we were talking about uh, glacial, uh, alpine glaciers in, in the west and glacial melt and sea level rise uh, by uh, Andrew Fountain. Uh, Connected with that uh, uh, Bloomer Lecture is a, often a banquet. The banquet is uh, a fairly formal affair. Uh, we honor various alumni at that uh, banquet, and we have an auction of uh, donated items that uh, provide funding for the next SLUGAC. That's the funding that you have to keep your eye on uh, so it doesn't disappear. There are many informal gatherings, uh, breakfast, lunches, uh, coffees, and the like, in between presentations uh, by alumni about their careers or about their research. Uh, there are opportunities for students to present their posters and, as I said, show their stuff. That gives the alumni some understanding of each of the students and what, they might, uh, what their interests might be. And there is, in the banquet, particularly administrative involvement. There are usually uh, uh, receptions and uh, presence, the presence of uh, various members of the administration who are invited to the, uh, uh, the banquet as well. Next. Uh, one of the key points is for the, that the department faculty realize that alumni are there, or our connection to the real world. It's an especially important connection at a liberal arts institution. And I think that the SLUGAC conference uh, cements that connection very nicely. Uh, it provides our student majors with opportunities to discuss uh, real world issues, to see within the, uh, the workings of various companies, uh, many of our alums are uh, operating their own companies, as a matter of fact, and so uh, they they have a, an authoritative view or an authoritative uh, uh, discussion about the ins and outs of uh, a career in geology or geosciences. 
Sarah? One of the things that um, is produced as part of SLUGAC is, our, is the proceedings, which in addition to the usual program information with the abstracts and the schedules and whatnot, we have resumes. Each alum is asked to submit a two-page resume uh, that basically uh, is to give the students a permanent record of the paths we've taken since we sat in their shoes um, and had that degree. Uh, the students are also asked to give a resume that t indicates what their career goals are, what their research interests are, um, and as resumes, they should be done in you know in a very professional manner. Um, alumni, some alumni feel they um, presenting a resume they've got too much to to, to present or or whatnot, that we've asked them all, and actually we've asked all alumni to give a brief description of themselves that gives some career highlights um, and degree highlights that all students are given before SLUGAC as kind of a introduction to the alumni so they can see who's coming and, and, and what they've done. Um, and if an alum did not present um, themselves with a resume, that also goes into the proceedings. And the important thing from that is that it has the alumni and the student contact information for use long after SLUGAC. I pull my proceedings out often to look for um, for information on, on alumni when people are asking how to find someone who works in a specific industry. I can pull out the resume and for people and go, yeah, I thought they worked for, um, for NASA or I thought they worked for, um, for this company or that. And so it's useful. It gives the students a, a roadmap to go back and look at. Um, and also gives them a wide array of resume formats. Um, as one thing that was noted is the students' resumes all looked the same because career planning gave them all a template. And they were able to see various ways of presenting themselves as a geologist by seeing the different um, ways alumni presented themselves. And so it can make them stand out uh, at corporations when everyone's sending their resume from career planning. Um, Let's see. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the alumni who have come to, to St. Lawrence for the, uh, the conference. We've had about 87 alumni have returned to it for at least one. And that's about 15%, which in some ways may not seem that much when Dallas is talking about having classes of um, having 100 majors at a time. We are a small liberal arts school in um, upstate New York. Uh, we think this is actually pretty good to have that many people come. Um, you can see here a progression of what um, time frame people had graduated from that had come to the conferences. You can see that the 1970s are very well represented at each of the SLUGACs. Um, and also the, the 1990s are very well representative. Um, and a lot of that can come into that many of the people who graduated in, in the 70s are in industry and are willing to use vacation time and travel time to come up and present their, themselves to the students. Uh, many from the 1990s were able to experience the SLUGAC and realize the importance and the benefit they gained and continue to try to come back and want to share with future generations of students. Um, and let's see. Many of the people who come back are, um, are in industry, um, but we do have several in academia, as well as many who are as graduate students come back. Um, and as you're a graduate student, you know that your budget was uh, usually pretty small. But it was deemed very important as a graduate student to come back for this event and to network with alums, uh, share your graduate school experience with the current students and whatnot. Um, and so you can see that industry and government um, people are very well represented here. Um, academia kind of wanes as this happens during the school year, and it's difficult for people to um, leave their own students, uh, but they do try. Uh, and you can see here we have a wide range of careers and employers of people who have come back. It's not just environmental consultants or just people from the petroleum industry. Um, we have a wide array of careers represented, as well as um, you know, the employers. We've got uh, government entities and museums and private corporations um, and whatnot. And so we're very well, the students get a wide cross-section of, of um, careers and em employment possibilities. Mark. Thanks. Uh, the point of this slide 
is to simply demonstrate that students are actively engaged in the process of planning and participation. There's quite a lot of buzz that occurs uh, prior to SLUGAC, and that buzz builds uh, a bit as the SLUGAC conference actually approaches. Through all of this, there's much informal interaction between alums and students. Uh, students gravitate to the alumni that seem to have shared interests with them. Uh, they understand those shared interests by reading the resumes, by uh, hearing the presentations that alumni have made, and uh, they gravitate to the, the alumni that are, give, are most interesting to them. Uh, networking begins. Next. This slide simply documents that SLUGAC is a dynamic event. It's a focus, it's always an alumni-student interaction. Many types happen, and both uh, group and individual levels are represented uh, with uh, uh, all of the proceedings that go on at SLUGAC. Sarah? And, and just to continue, I mean, the alumni continue to come back. Uh, this is, a, I believe we're now to a self-sustaining point. Uh, we've done seven of these. And alumni come back for the, the same reason. Um, they want to connect with the students and feel uh, a loyalty to the department and ensuring that future generations have uh, the information they need to move, move into the workforce and to graduate school. Um, and alumni you know that we want to share um, the and there's just the tradition of working with the department and working with students and we want to, to be able to continue that um, and overall the SLUGAC effect has helped students um, as they're involved in the planning and being able to connect with alumni and just creating those friendships um, and a significant Thing is that many new alums come back for the first LUGAC after graduation, so they participated in the student and they saw that value and did what they could to come back. Um, and probably the, the single most thing from the student perspective is that students are able to answer the question from their parents of just what are you going to do with that degree in geology? They have now been presented with what 30 or 40 other people have done with the same degree they, they're sitting there earning. Um, and so students are um, have a wealth of information that, and as well as a community of people to connect with for help and, and getting more information. Um, and so our, our alumni connections to the students and students connection to alumni is, is strengthened and our alumni network is strengthened at all levels as you have people who graduated in the 70s, 50s, 60s, 90s and, and 2000s all getting to meet and wanting to work together. Um, and continue to help the students and, and help each other. Mark? Uh, the next slide. Some closing thoughts. Uh, I'll let the viewers uh, read the slide for themselves and I'll simply reiterate that this SLUGAC conference and much that goes with it is an altruistic event. Alumni donate themselves to make it happen. That altruism is, in part, a reflection of experiences at SLUGAC while they were students. It's a reflection of other uh, involvement at St. Lawrence while they were students. As educators, our actions can also encourage such altruism when we give of our own time and energy in support of student learning. Students recognize that. They accept it. They uh, emulate it. Uh, so much of what goes on with alumni relations relates to uh, what goes on with faculty-student relations uh, before graduation. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for, for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah and, and Mark. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, we're going to go now and uh, open up the panel discussion start answering some questions from everyone. We have a few questions already that I'm going to go ahead and pose. Um, our first one is, uh, makes note that uh, both Sarah and Susan, you are alum of your undergraduate institution. And so the question is for 
um, faculty and alum, does your outreach to undergraduate alum differ from your outreach to graduate alums? And if so, what strategies do you recommend for these two groups? Um, well, I'll start there. St. Lawrence is an undergraduate only institution, so they don't have to worry about um, out separating out to different different uh, fields. Um, and when I went to graduate school, there's a very different kind of, of outreach. There's a newsletter that comes out once every three or four years. And so it's a very different kind of, you know, each institution, the, the little r's to the, the R1, have a different approach and different va what value they see in their alumni. I have a, a similar response as Sarah that uh, my, my undergraduate was a uh, just an undergraduate uh, department as well. Um, and so they have a, a very, very strong uh, alumni connection. Uh, for my graduate school, it is an undergraduate and um, a graduate program, and it's much different. Um, there's a newsletter and, um, and typical events at, uh, at professional meetings and whatnot, but uh, it's far less in terms of the, the website and coordinating annual events and special activities. I had a little bit different experience. Uh, I was uh, at an undergraduate only institution uh, where the connections are very strong, but I went to a graduate program that also had very strong connections, and so I was uh, probably indoctrinated in strong connections uh, at both institutions, and uh, so maybe I'm a little more gung-ho than, uh, than the average geology faculty member. <clears throat> Okay, Dallas, do you have any insights as to uh, how Georgia Southern outreaches to undergraduate or graduate? Well, I think the most important things we've done are the, the newsletter, which I don't know. We I have always maintained that the newsletter actually needed to be in hard copy, needed to be mailed, and needed to be put in people's hands. And I, 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 I'm now in a position where I have to question that whether that's going to continue to be true or not. Uh, it costs a lot of money, but it does provide some, some obvious feedback about whether or not the addresses are still correct. Um, Susan and I were talking about this earlier, about the importance of social media and connecting students to the department. And I suspect for her generation and the one that's coming along now, social media are probably going to end up being far more important than the print. Um, but I still happen to be a fan of actually putting paper in people's hands. Great. Um, here's a question coming in from a community college. Now I know, you know, we're looking at two four-year institutions, but what is your advice for um, faculty and alums of large urban community colleges that have low budgets? And so, what would be your advice for connecting with and engaging their alumni? The web, many websites and LinkedIn and, and Facebook are all free. So you've, got, you've only got the time you put into it. I, I think it all comes down to maintaining communication. And once you've got that com line of communication open, you can try to figure out what makes the most sense for your, um, for your area. But you know, if you're in an urban setting, you can probably invite someone to, to come speak and use those electronic resources. Yeah, you're not getting that paper in someone's hand because you don't have the money, but you can use um, use a website to, to reach your alumni, and it's not going to cost as much. I, I would also add that uh, there, there's always a sense of, um, of gratitude to, to a department that you attended. So uh, just asking uh, uh, alumni to come back and, and talk to uh, certain classes and just give them some, some life experiences and, and lessons learned uh, is a good way to keep your alumni engaged and contributing to the department. I would also say that as a result of one workshop I went to somewhere along the line, and I've forgotten what it was, that making one contact a year isn't going to be enough. The prevailing wisdom seems to be it takes three contacts a year to really keep people connected to the department. Uh, for us at Southern, that meant the newsletter, uh, it meant the annual geo party, and it meant the, uh, the homecoming event at which we always have alumni speak on what they were doing now, whether they be people who are in graduate school at the moment or people who have been out in the uh, industry for some period of time. So 
you have to continue to make contact. One time a year probably isn't going to be enough to really keep people connected. I would agree with that. I think that uh, individual faculty who have particular working relationships with their students and therefore an opportunity to have shared experiences with their with them as alumni uh, can do a lot by uh, personally keeping in touch with uh, students. Uh, I do a lot of that. I enjoy it. They are my colleagues. Uh, they were colleagues here when they were working with me. Uh, as students and they are colleagues uh, now when they are out in the real world. Uh, I think that uh, just sharing a Christmas card or sharing uh, uh, various emails together does an awful lot to uh, keep that contact uh, available. It's important. Great, and we've got a couple more questions, just, just two more here. One is, uh, can you comment on how your alumni re outreach activities have helped to recruit new students in your department and retain the ones that you currently have? Um, because I know in the geosciences, um, there is definitely issues with retention and recruitment. So how do these uh, help your departments on those regards? Well, one of the things that I've noticed at St. Lawrence is that alumni whose, whose children themselves are interested in the geosciences uh, are happy to encourage their children to come to St. Lawrence. Uh, so a lot of, uh, a fair number each year of our students are, are children of alumni who are also geology majors at one point. Uh, that may be a, seem like a small number, but two or three each year is, uh, is an important number. And I think, that, I think that something that Sarah said is very important. I've always believed that the best people to recruit new geology majors are the geology majors you have. I think the students are the best ambassadors that are, that we are available to us. And when Sarah pointed out that students could answer their parents' question about what are you going to do with a degree in geosciences, I think that was a really important point. If those alumni help the current students know what the future might hold for them and how, what kind of life they could have as a geoscience major, those students themselves then become resources for others who may be wavering about whether or not this is the right decision for them. And I think that when they've got the right answers and know exactly what, how to answer the questions for them, it can make all the difference in the world. And Building on that, one uh, one flute deck that stands out in my mind was a student who was a double major in the arts and in geology, and she wanted to go pursue the arts side, but she was afraid she wouldn't be able to go back and do geology. The geologists in you know grad schools would look at that um, negatively, and I was able to talk to her about how some of the skills she needed to do for the arts things she wanted to do, how that would how that very much tied into geology uh, in, in management skills and, and being able to coordinate things and how um, just being able to share that experience and help show that you know, you're know you not just going to go out with a, a rock hammer and, and bang on rocks or look at thin sections. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. And just being able to be a resource to students to see different ways of presenting themselves or and their interests and how to, to move on. And we have some of our more prominent alumni um, are photographers and our art professors, and but they come at it with the geology framework and they and what that's what their their sources are and being able to share with the students the multiple ways of the sharing their research their in, their interests can and, and build off that degree in geology that they're not a one dimensional being that they might have with their preconception they they find this geology course interesting, but they're not sure what they're going to do with it, we were able to show them the multifaceted um, you know, individual that they are. I would say just one last point um, is bringing alumni in, not just to only talk with, uh, with your current students, but also to just large introductory classes and show people that who are not yet majors uh, or undeclared the different avenues within a geoscience career. Great, and just one last question um, for Mark and 
and Sarah, when in the school year does SLUVAC occur? Um, it usually happens in the fall, uh, in October. Uh, squeeze somewhere between Parents Weekend and Homecoming and, and those types of events. Uh, we did have one in the spring uh, due to the New York uh, Geo uh, Geological Society meetings were happening in the fall, and so that impacted things. Uh, but then we ran into problems with, with snow, um, and we try to have it in the, in the fall. Um, obviously, uh, the students preferred, when we asked them if, what they preferred, they wanted it in the fall because it gave them the whole school year to act on it, particularly those that were um, going to be applying to graduate school or be applying for jobs so for the seniors. Um, it kind of got them focused on what they needed to be doing and thinking about. And so from this, when we asked the students, they all wanted it to stay in the fall. Um, so they had time to act on what they had learned, where if we didn't do it until the spring, um, well, that's after they've applied. For the seniors, that's after they've applied for grad school and have been applying for jobs. And, and so that's why we try to keep it in the fall. And it's worked very well there. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's all of our questions for today's webinar. Um, so if you have any questions that were not addressed today, you can email them to us at workforce at agiweb.org. And we'll make sure to go ahead and send your questions along to the speakers. Um, we'll be posting today's recorded webinar on our GeoWebinars website soon. And you can visit that website which is listed here at the bottom of the slide, www.agiweb.org slash workforce slash webinars.html. You can visit the website and you'll be able to view this webinar as soon as we get it posted, as well as all of our previous ones. And you can also check out the webinar schedule for upcoming events um, and new webinars. So thank you, Dallas, Susan, and Mark, and Sarah for your presentations today. Really appreciate you taking the time to um, tell us about what's going on at your universities, and um, this concludes our webinar for today. So thank you very much, everyone.